Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I want to thank you very much for tuning in today to hear a little bit about some Texas history. It's been a very eventful couple of weeks for me here at Wise About Texas. We've been doing a lot of speaking engagements. I had the real pleasure and honor to speak at Washington on the Brazos at their annual Texas Independence Day celebration. The weather didn't cooperate. Uh, we've talked before about the revolution in 1836 and how rainy that spring was. Well, it rained on us at Washington on the Brazos, but we had a great turnout and we had a lot of fun celebrating Texas Independence. I've been doing a lot of traveling recently, spending a lot of time in Austin. I never fail to uh, stop and do a little bit of historical research every time I'm there and try to get some new ideas for the podcast, which I was very successful in doing. I took a, a very interesting trip last week to Larry McMurtry's bookstore in Archer City, and that was just a fascinating experience. Over 200,000 books in one place, which is pretty much heaven to a history buff. The best part of the whole trip was a group of us walked into the store, and there stood Larry McMurtry himself, so we got to talk to him, and it was very pleasant and a very interesting trip. Got some great ideas for some new episodes, and I'm excited about all the stuff that's coming up. Uh, getting lots of great feedback from the listeners. Thank you very much. When you get a minute, leave a review on iTunes and shoot me an email about what you'd like to hear about. Um, I had one in, one gentleman approach me at Washington on the Brazos, a fan of the podcast, and gave me a lot of great original material on his ancestor, Thomas Rusk. So we're going to get into some of that and talk about Thomas Rusk in an upcoming episode. And uh, I really appreciate the engagement that uh, listeners from around the state are providing the show and I'm learning some interesting stories and and uh, getting some great ideas so keep those ideas coming. Well last episode we talked about the Battle of Tampico and that's a, a battle that we don't think about very much in the context of the Texas Revolution but a general named Jose Mejia led an expedition against the Mexican port of Tampico and it turned out not to be a, a very good idea not to be a success and it's one of those forgotten battles of the Texas Revolution, and there are a couple of more that I want to cover today. And uh, I want to do so, I want to expand a little bit on the context of the Matamoros expedition that hatched the Tampico attack and the other couple of battles that we're going to discuss today. So let's go back to 1835 and get wise about Texas. Now, in the context of several other stories that we've talked about on the podcast, we've discussed the idea that uh, several in Texas wanted to lead an attack on the interior of Mexico and the port of Matamoros. Sam Houston referred to it as Matamoros fever, uh, but I wanted to give you a little more context on what was going on at that time. What we have covered is the fact that the council, the general council in Texas, ended up in a severe split over the issue of attacking Matamoros, and it almost blew up the government. And we talked a little bit uh, last episode about the Matamoros expedition because we were discussing that Battle of Tampico, which was one part of a bigger picture. So I want to give you a little more about the bigger picture. Uh, back in the early 1830s, the government in Monclova, the uh, purported uh, legislature of Coahuila, Texas, and I say purported because the people in Saltillo thought they were the capital of Coahuila, Texas. So, uh, but Monclova was selling land in Texas to speculators who then were going to turn around and make a significant profit on the deal. And there were a bunch of them, many of them names you've heard, and uh, they were buying this land from Monclova. And there was some dispute about whether that land, whether those land grants, those land sales were valid. And that dispute was brewing in the background of the Texas Revolution. So the, the government in Monclova was a Federalist government. Now the dispute in Mexico was between the Federalist and the Centralist. Santa Ana was originally a Federalist, became a Centralist, and became more than that, of course, as he declared himself dictator. The Federalists were generally in favor of the Mexican Constitution of 1824, which, of course, Stephen F. Austin was in favor of, and the people in Texas, having come from the United States, which also has a Federalist system. They wanted the Federalist government in Mexico uh, 
to prevail. Plus, we had these, uh, what I'll call the Monclova land speculators. Well, some of the speculators were people that uh, were going to end up funding uh, the revolution. And so this was a serious situation. And the thought of attacking Madame Morris uh, began in the, in the fall of 1835 to become a more significant idea. There was a commander of the Texas garrison at Goliad named Demet. Demet believed that Philip Demet, excuse me, Philip Demet believed that the Federalists in the interior of Mexico would respond favorably if the Texans attacked Matamoros and would rise up in revolution against the Centralists. And so the larger context of this is that the Texians at the time were really trying to participate in what were already a series of revolutions in Mexico of the Federalists against the Centralists. And revolution almost isn't the right word. It's, it's a continuing conflict, and the power shifted back and forth. But the Texans were participating with other Mexican citizens in trying to stir up this Federalist res- revolution and support the Federalists against the Centralists. This was not initially... Uh, and we've covered this several times, but it's important to remember this was not initially a fight for the independence of Texas to create a new republic, although that idea certainly had taken hold in the minds of many. What was really going on, at least at first, was that the Texans were trying to participate meaningfully in supporting the Federalist cause. So Demet suggests to Austin in a letter that, that... this is what he wrote. I'll just quote it. Quote, an attack on Matamoros would be approved and sustained by a majority of the people in that section of the country. Close quote. So he was trying to convince Austin that attacking Matamoros was a great idea, and Austin agreed. Uh, and Austin wrote in another letter, Austin, Stephen F. Austin wrote, quote, nothing will aid Texas so much as an expedition from New Orleans against Matamoros under General Mejia. It is all important. Close quote. Now, remember, Mejia was hanging around Uh, as a Mexican Federalist, and was uh, getting a lot of support from the Texas General Council to, to, as what I call a revolutionary consultant. He was sort of consulting on uh, internal political and military affairs in Mexico and encouraging uh, this Federalist support. Austin wrote in another letter uh, the following, quote, Even a rumor of such a thing, meaning an attack on Matamoros, even a rumor of such a thing, would keep the centralist troops from being sent to Texas, close quote. Well, now we know, of course, that Austin was dead wrong about that, but um, he believed strongly that if the Texans could attack the interior of Mexico, as well as the port of Tampico, that the uh, people, the federalist supporters, would rise up and they would aid the federalist cause. They also thought that if they could capture Mount Morris, Uh, they would choke off the supplies to the centralists because Matamoros was a very important port in Mexico. And I think they probably were right if they could have pulled it off. But, um, of course, that would not come to pass. Demet actually uh, put his money where his mouth was. He led an expedition against a fort called Lepantatlan. And, of course, I'm butchering that name, I'm sure, for which I apologize. But he took an expedition out. This was a fort uh, up the Nueces River from the town of San Patricio, He attacked it and killed many of the troops. Uh, The Mexican troops abandoned the fort, went back to Mexico. Demet ended up with uh, lots of horses. They burned the buildings and tried to dismantle the earthworks in the fort, Uh, and that was a great success. So Demet returns to Goliad having conquered the only real uh, remaining Mexican outpost uh, between General Coase and Bejar, and the interior of Mexico. So the communication was impacted, of course, and it sort of isolated Coast and Bejar. That was that occurred uh, on October 31st and the following days of 1835. That's when Demet led that expedition. So Coast is now cut off in Bejar, and uh, the, the troops had gone back to Mexico. So Demet was not only talking about the attack, he was starting... Um, starting to move. Now, let me say a word 
uh, just so we're clear on the situation with the military command in Texas, because this is where you can start to see how the government was really coming apart. The provisional governor, Henry Smith, had ordered Sam Houston to organize the army and attack Matamoros, Uh, but he didn't have an army to organize. He was going to have to raise it. The council, who was already starting to split from Smith, ordered uh, Burleson, Ed Burleson, to organize a Matamoros expedition. Uh, James Grant and Francis Johnson, Frank Johnson, who, by the way, were business partners in some of those Monclova land deals um, owning Texas land, they decided they were going from Behar to attack Matamoros on their own. Now, we mentioned this, uh, I mentioned this in the last episode, and then I talked a little bit about it in a couple other episodes, about how there were multiple commanders purportedly in command of various segments of the Army. And you had a group of volunteers, uh, and then you had a group, uh, well, didn't really have a group. You had a purported regular Army or the authority to have one, but, of course, they didn't have many men in it. And so you had multiple uh, commanders. Grant uh, Fannin, by the way, James Fannin was also commissioned as a colonel uh, to work by the council to work on the Matamoros expedition. So you had Houston, you had Grant, and you had Fannin. Burleson had gone with Stephen F. Austin to the United States uh, as agents for Texas. So we we now have three commanders. Grant goes down with his force to Goliad and uh, asserts authority over Philip Dimmitt, who is still at Goliad, uh, commanding his troops. And Grant says, I'm the proper commander. You're going to turn everything over to me, and uh, I'm going to take it on to Matamoros. Now, this caused a little controversy, as you might expect, and many of the men thought there was actually going to be a shooting war between Grant's men and Demet's men. So you can imagine the disarray that existed in that fort. Um, by the way, this is pretty funny. The, the men under Fannin had uh, issued a written declaration of independence. They had already declared independence from Mexico, and they had a, a flag called the Bloody Arm Flag, and I'll dig up a picture of it and put it on the website. But they had raised the Bloody Arm Flag over... Presidio La Bahia and, and declared themselves independent from Mexico without, of course, any authority from the council, but whatever. And uh, Demet took that flag down, and I suspect that's probably uh, one of the things that caused a lot of problems. Houston, in the meantime, began to realize uh, that he was not going to have an army to command and not going to have uh, the opportunity to wage a great battle against Mexico at Matamoros. So he sort of changed his tune on the idea of attacking Matamoros and started trying to convince people it was not that good an idea. And uh, we have talked about that in the past. Um, The whole situation uh, resulted in extreme conflict between Smith and the council. Um, And remember, right during this time when this was all happening and they were trying to get organized, That's when Mejia led the Tampico expedition, which, of course, got wiped out. And so people began to realize that maybe attacking Mexico was not going to work out the way they thought it would. Maybe it was a bad idea. Uh, Grant and Johnson, of course, had land to go protect. So they had a little extra incentive to go down there and attack. So not only was there disarray in Goliad uh, between Grant and Demet, and then further disarray with Houston changing his mind about how things ought to go. Um, But you also had this whole situation resulting in extreme conflict at Washington on the Brazos, where, uh, as I talked about in the last episode, Grant declares the council dissolved, the council turns around and impeaches him, he refuses to leave, uh, and in the meantime, all these military forces are out in the field. So it was a total, absolute mess. But those forces were in the field, and they were uh, undertaking some activity, and that's what I want to talk about, tell you a couple of stories about a couple of battles that uh, are not lost to history but are not often discussed when you talk about the Texas Revolution. The first one is the Battle of San Patricio. Grant and Johnson took their expedition Uh, to San Patricio. Sam Houston caught up with him. He convinced many of the men to uh, 
abandon the expedition and leave the force. But Grant and Johnson still had some men, and they made it all the way down to Matamoros. Um, They had hoped to, of course, hook up with revolutionaries. That never really materialized. Uh, Interestingly, I read in one source that there was a British representative of the East India Company with Grant and Johnson for a period of time, and he was actually killed uh, on that expedition. So the British government had a little bit of involvement in secret. Uh, We talked a little bit about some of the politics of that in the episode on the annexation of Texas. Um, But Grant and Johnson, nevertheless, go down. The, The revolution doesn't materialize like they think. They're coming back to San Patricio, where he surprises a Mexican commander named Rodriguez. Uh, He ends up taking some Mexican prisoners. Uh, Those prisoners later escape, but he did get a number of horses uh, from the Mexicans, which he stashed at a ranch owned by Julian de la Garza. Now, here's where it gets interesting. That was just outside of town, and um, Grant and his men uh, occupied the town. Some of the men camped on the public square in the town, and some of the men uh, camped in houses owned by the citizens. The What Grant didn't realize was that General Urea was on his way from Matamoros uh, to, put, to help Santa Ana squash the rebellion, and Urea had arranged a network of spies because the citizens were not all that thrilled with some of the conduct of the Texans. And so the citizens were actually aiding General Urea and spying on the Texans' movements. So Urea knows that Grant and Johnson are camped at San Patricio. There is a legend, and I have not been able to authoritatively confirm this, but it's a good story. The legend is that Urea told the townspeople to keep their candles burning in their houses and Urea would leave the house alone because his spies, of course, had told him that many of the Texans were occupying some of the houses. And the story goes that Frank Johnson, the uh, Texan co-commander, was working late and had a candle burning. So he escaped getting killed or captured when Urea came and attacked uh, San Patricio. But Urea did attack, and he was successful Uh, He killed, the number varies, but 8 to 10 Texans, several escaped. Uh, He took 13 prisoners of the Texans. Um, There's some question about where the dead were buried. One story has them buried in the churchyard. One story has them buried on something called the Old Cemetery. But nevertheless, uh, that battle was not successful for the Texans, and Urea continued his march to chase down Grant and his section of the troops. You see, they had split with the dealing with the horses and everything. Johnson had come back to San Patricio, but Grant was still out there. Uh, Urea caught up with him near uh, Agua Dulce, a place called Agua Dulce. He ambushed Grant. Uh, they were on a creek, and he uh, killed or captured all of Grant's men uh, except for a few just a very few, and uh, Grant was killed in that battle, and there's some dispute about whether he was killed in the battle or whether he surrendered and they executed him or what have you. But anyway, Grant met his end, and uh, Urea stayed around in San Patricio for a while uh, and then continued his march into the interior of Texas. In fact, he was there uh, when the Alamo fell uh, in early March uh, and then proceeded east uh, on Santa Ana's orders, and but of course uh, was not directly involved uh, in any more fighting, uh, and San Jacinto intervened. So that was the Battle of San Patricio, and the next, uh, and of course grew out of Grant and Johnson's uh, idea to go attack Matamoros on their own. Uh, the next battle I want to talk about is the Battle of Refurio. And Refurio in the late 1700s, there was a mission founded, and the mission was called Nuestra Señora del Refugio, and it was eventually closed or aban- and abandoned by 1830. But the mission still stood uh, in the town that had been named for it. Uh, they named the town Refugio. It was settled by Irish colonists, 
So let's go to March. Uh, that Battle of San Patricio had been at the end of February 1836. So now we're in the beginning of March 1836. And the Alamo uh, has been under siege and has fallen. While that was occurring, James Fannin, uh, we mentioned him earlier, had the men at Goliad. He had actually gone down to the coast to the port of Capano to secure the port, and which would be a launch point, of course, for the Madame Morris expedition. Uh, that never came about. But as he was returning to Goliad, he sent uh, a man named Eamon King and about 30 men to Refurio. And Urea's army, of course, is coming up. And so King was to uh, rescue the families, the Texan families that were in Refurio and try to get them to come to La Bahia uh, at Goliad. But King could not resist uh, remember, the uh, the rancheros of the area had helped Urea in connection with the Battle of San Patricio. So King thought, well, I'm going to punish these citizens for helping Urea. The focus of his wrath was a man named Carlos de la Garza. De la Garza was a prominent rancher. Um, he had given some folks some refuge when Fannin and his men had attacked the ranch uh, in sort of a sub-skirmish. Earlier, uh, Fannin's men had behaved poorly, apparently, and uh, De La Garza was thought to be, uh, being the most prominent citizen in the area, sort of the head of the spy network for Urea, etc. So King uh, decides he's going to, before he brings these families to Goliad, uh, he's going to attack De La Garza and his rancheros. But what he did, uh, he did attack, but he also grossly underestimated their fighting strength and their spirit. And so King was forced to retreat into the mission, uh, the remains of the mission Nuestra Senora del Refurio. Fannin gets wind of this and sends a man named Ward, one of his lieutenant colonels, William Ward, and the uh, men from Georgia who had joined the Texas cause, the Georgia Battalion. And uh, he sent him over to Refurio to relieve King. Um, so Ward shows up and rescues King, but the Ward and King get into an argument about who ought to be the proper commander. Um, and then the argument apparently was fairly severe. And the result of the hat was that the Texan army split. So once again, we have a situation where Uh, There's arguments about command and total disorganization in the army. The one thing they did agree on, though, was that they wanted to fight. So now we have two armies eager to continue the revolution. So King takes his uh, men and goes to attack the rancheros again. So they leave the mission and they go to attack. Ward and his men stayed in the mission. Well, then Urea showed up. Urea's army arrives at the mission. He's got about 1,500 men. In the meantime, King returns, attempts to return to the mission after punishing the rancheros. Uh, as he approaches, he runs smack into the rear guard of Urea's army. So now they had a problem. Um, so King and his men are fighting uh, Urea's army on the ground. Uh, Ward is in the mission. Uh, They are inflicting heavy casualties on the Mexican army, uh, but they were also running out of food and water and ammunition. Um, Ward, there's some communication with Fannin. Fannin orders Ward to go to Victoria and that Fannin would meet him there. Uh, So Ward leaves the mission and uh, in the middle of the night and starts off for Victoria. King's men, in the meantime, tried to escape also during the middle of the night, but the next day were captured by Urea's army and marched back into the mission, which, of course, is now occupied by Urea. And so uh, everybody that was there, King and all his remaining men, and the men from Ward's group that had stayed behind to care for the wounded, they were all executed, uh, except for a couple. And uh, there were two Germans um, who were spared uh, by a German lieutenant colonel in the Mexican army 
named Juan Jose Holzinger, who decided to uh, spare his fellow Germans. The other person that was spared was a man named Louis Ayers. And the story goes that Ayers was led out with the other men to be executed, but gave a Masonic sign to one of the officers, and the officer spared his life. Now, you know, that's a good story. Uh, can't know for sure if it's true. Ayers wrote a letter that I found, and the letter was written in December of 1836 to some of his relatives, and he discusses his experience in the battle. And what he says was that his wife, uh, with their four children, approached General Urea and, uh, in Ayers' words, quote, excited his sympathy by their tears, close quote. So his wife and children are crying. Uh, some of the Mexican officers were against the execution of prisoners and uh, that General Urea agreed to save Ayers' life at that point. Um, so we don't know for sure what happened, uh, but the Ayers' family tradition certainly is that uh, his Masonic apron and Masonic signs given to the officers played a role in sparing his life. So perhaps they did. Uh, Ayers did write something in this letter, this 1836 letter, letter about how he was released. Uh, he was released after being spared from execution, and this is what he said the Mexican general did. He said, uh, I was given in, quote, I was given in some degree my liberty after receiving a severe lecture on account of my hostility to Mexico and charging me to behave myself better in the future and let politics alone. I merely bowed and said nothing, close quote. So I thought that was a pretty good uh, description of what had happened to him after his life was spared. So back to Ward's men. Ward's men, as I said, had gotten out of the mission and were headed toward Victoria, which they finally reached. The problem was Urea's men had gotten there first. So Ward and his men, after sneaking around, uh, get to Victoria and found Urea's troops already there. Um... So they tried to retreat, they were overtaken, and eventually had to surrender uh, to Urea. Urea ended up marching them back to Goliad, to the mission at La Bahia, where they joined Fannin's men, who were prisoners there. And of course, uh, on March 27, 1836, uh, were executed in the Goliad massacre with the rest of his men. And it's interesting to think about uh, what might have happened had Fannin not sent uh, Ward and King to Refurio uh, to meet Urea and had had all those men with him at the Battle of Colito Creek where Fannin was eventually captured because that was 100 to 150 men that Fannin uh, sent away from his army. So uh, consider that and maybe Fannin would have had a little more success against Urea uh, had he had those extra men. In any event, the uh, battles of San Patricio and Refurio uh, are little discussed. Uh, they were important. They had important effects. And they, uh, unfortunately, were not successful for the Texans. But if you think about it, uh, there were really very few battles that were successful for the Texans. We won the Battle of Behar in 1835. And we're not going to win another victory of any significance, and we're going to suffer some disastrous losses uh, right up until April 21st. So uh, the battles of San Patricio and Refurio uh, were two of those. And, uh, of course, the fallen Texans in those battles deserve to be remembered as active participants in the Texas Revolution. Well, now we come to the segment of the show called Getting There, where I tell you how to get to a couple of the places we talked about in the episode and go see it. I'm going to start at uh, Refurio with the mission Nuestra Señora del Refurio. That site uh, remains a church. It's Our Lady of Refuge Catholic Church in Refurio. The address is 1008 South Alamo Street in Refurio, and it sits right on Highway 77. So Highway 77... Uh, runs through Refurio, and uh, as you're going south on your right, it's sort of on the far edge of town, is Our Lady of Refuge Church. And apparently, and I have not personally confirmed this, but apparently you can see some remnants of the mission in the church yard and uh, under the church building, part of the uh, original bricks of the mission still exist. So uh, hopefully 
somebody listening to this will go check that out and give me a report. And certainly next time I'm down there, I'm going to stop from and see it for myself. The next place uh, that I want to talk about is San Patricio. San Patricio, Texas is located west of Corpus Christi. If you go out of Corpus Christi on FM 624, take a right or go north on FM 666. And that will run you right through San Patricio. In San Patricio, you'll find several historical markers uh, on the corner of Maine and McGloin uh, commemorating various events that we've discussed. The site of uh, Fort Lepontalon is preserved as a state historic site. It's located off of Texas State Road 359, which is uh, at the intersection of FM 624 and FM 70. So a little bit, uh, keep going past San Patricio uh, on 624, and you'll come to the the Pontadon State Historic Site, which is the site of that old fort. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you again for listening to some stories of forgotten battles of the Texas Revolution. Uh, This podcast is going to be released on Monday, March the 20th, 2017, so we are smack in the middle of the high holy days of Texas history. We're seven days away from the anniversary of the massacre at Goliad, and I'll put up a reminder of that and direct you to the episode we did on that last year. Uh, I hope that everyone has an enjoyable uh, rest of the month of March and a great spring. The weather's starting to get nice here in Texas. The blue bonnets are coming out, which is always one of my favorite times of year. Follow Wise About Texas on Facebook. Our Facebook page can be found at Wise About Texas. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. And if you're enjoying the preservation and promotion of Texas history, consider throwing a couple dollars in support of this show. Uh, Our patronage is really picking up, and I want to thank everyone who's supporting the show. It does cost some money to put this show together and do some of the traveling and research that I'm doing. So uh, certainly appreciate your support. You can support the show at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wise about Texas. That's Patreon dot com slash wise about Texas. Keep those emails coming with your topic suggestion. I've got a lot of great uh, topics coming up in the podcast and I really appreciate you listening and learning about Texas history. So until next time, go out and do something for Texas today. God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.